Hey, everyone, and welcome to Photomasters Live. Happy Earth Day. I'm here today with my guest co-host, the legendary Canon Explorer of Light, Rick Salmon, my good friend. How you doing, Rick? Well, uh, until you said legendary, I was doing okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you very, thank you very much for the, uh, thank you very much for the compliment. And it is great to be here, especially on Earth Day. You know, we're going to talk about this awesome project that uh, that we've been working on for a couple of months. We're going to officially launch it today, so uh, it's going to be a, a great, great uh, webinar. We really want to thank everyone for tuning in. Yeah, please, everyone who comes on in, uh, just go into the chat. Let us know where you are from. And you'll notice that the chat is divided into two columns. There's the regular chat, and then there's the Q&A only. So if you have any questions for Rick and I that come up during the webinar or any sort of, you know, photography question that you're just burning to ask us, uh, please put it in the Q&A only column. We'll monitor both, uh, but it's easier for us if you put it in the Q&A column. But feel free to chat among yourselves in the chat column. Say hi. Let us know where you're from. And we've also got a live poll. Uh, what is your favorite continent for photography? I know it's kind of a silly poll, uh, but it is kind of our theme today. We're going to talk about travel photography and this new venture that Rick and I are going to announce today is tied into that theme. So we're just kind of curious where your favorite place to photograph is. Is it North America, South America, Europe, Africa, Asia, <laughs> Oceania, which is now the official continent name for like Australia, New Zealand and all the South Pacific or Antarctica. So please let us know. And as I said, if you want to just say hi really quick, we got some folks coming in from the UK, from Canada, of course, a bunch of folks from the US. Um, we've got someone from Mexico. Uh, so yeah, we've got quite a diverse group coming in here today. I, so, I see Lori. I see Lori, our friend from uh, uh, Nick, you know, Nick Software. Uh, she's from California. All right. I want to ask if she mows a lawn. I, she saw a picture of me. I posted a picture of me cutting my lawn the other day. Do you like cutting your lawn in? I, you know, I'm not a uh, lawn cutter, so no. my wife and I hire a lawn service oh. um, because I, I just do not enjoy mowing my own lawn. I, I think some people like doing it. They feel, I love it. feel. I think you like it, right? Reputed, but anyway, uh, Lori was saying that she likes uh, cutting the lawn. But yeah, we have people from uh, all over uh, Cal California, Canada, Sarasota. Hey, Kay from. Uh, from uh, Sarasota, do you ever go to a Mayaka, Mayaka River State Park? Maybe she could. Have you ever been there, Ian? No, I've never even heard of it until you mentioned it to me. It seems like an amazing place. I've done some bird photography down in Florida. I know there's a lot of really famous places. Yeah. Uh, I've only been down there like once or twice. I went to Ding Darling National Wildlife Thank Refuge and had an good. amazing time. I could not believe how many birds I saw in photograph when I was there. It was, it was just incredible. Yeah. The early part of the year, as you know, is a time to go. So if anyone's listening and they hear we, us talk about a place, you know, time means everything, right? So Yeah, April, absolutely. We were there in January. It was great. But January, February, March, April are really, uh, really good. Stan is from uh, Sarasota. Oh, I know Stan. All oh, right. This is well, great. everyone, please check out our live poll. Let us know uh, where your favorite place in the world, continent-wise, uh, it is to photograph. And it looks like North America has taken an early lead. Uh, I guess that makes <laughs> yeah. sense because most of our viewers are from North America. But I'm sure that there are folks who are out traveling. Uh, me personally, I think if I had to pick, I would pick Africa is my favorite continent for photography. It's really just amazing and incredibly diverse. And there's something about the wildlife there in Africa. I mean, there's great wildlife all over the world. You know, here in the United States, we've got some really amazing wildlife as well. But there's just this number and diversity that you find in Africa that is just found nowhere else in the world. It's really incredible. Rick, what about you? What's your favorite continent to photograph on? Well, Africa is amazing because you could get so close to the animals and people who haven't gone there, you know, isn't it amazing, Ian, that, you know, <clears throat> you're driving around and a lion could come like, you know, or you're right up to your, your vehicle. Sometimes I've seen cheetahs, you know, jump right on. But I would yeah. say, uh, you know, Antarctica, with, I know you like the blue ice, right? Oh, you yeah, know? absolutely. Glaciers are amazing. Blue the blue ice up in Greenland is amazing. I love your pictures from up there. But I think uh, I think Antarctica and South Georgia Island, uh, it's, they're just amazing for the blue ice and the animals. And, and speaking about time, you want to go there in their summer, which is like December, January. But I, yeah. I love the animals down there. And, you know, who doesn't love a penguin, right? Right. <laughs> well, so I haven't been to Antarctica, but I have been to the Falklands, which is oh, like yeah. Antarctica light. And yeah. it was really amazing just 
hanging out with the penguins because that's what you do. I mean, you're not just photographing them. Yeah. The penguins, they don't care that you're there. They don't see you as a threat. They walk right up to you. They'll have a conversation with you. The penguin will walk right. up and they'll squawk at you and you can squawk yeah. back at it. And uh, you can make friends with a penguin. It's really an amazing experience. And well, yeah, and I, you know, these amazing experiences are part of the reason why, you know, I personally love travel photography. And, you know, I'm, I guess I'm kind of thinking of travel photography pretty broadly. So, you know, typically as a genre, we might think of travel photography as photographing other cultures and maybe architectural features that are important to that particular mm -hmm. culture. Uh, but of course, just traveling, whether you're doing wildlife or landscape photography, just having that travel experience uh, is just such an amazing thing. And it's one of the things I love about photography, getting out there, exploring different places, different cultures. How about you, Rick? Oh, I agree. I think traveling, there's a saying, traveling is a great education. And whether you're learning about the wildlife, right, the, the penguins, you know, or the albatrosses or whatever, but the culture. You know, I, I love, Susan and I spend a lot of time, or I've spent a lot of time, you know, Southeast Asia. You know, I love the, the Buddhist culture there. And we love going to Nepal and, and India and just seeing how other people live. And, you know, what's important to other people? We were down in the rainforest in Brazil. And we were in this, uh, in this Tariano Indian tribe. And what they're, they're interested in is they're, survive, they're interested in trying to survive until the next day. You know, we're, we're checking our email. We're doing, not, not down there, but I'm saying people in general. They're checking their email. They're texting. They're doing all the stuff. They're planning everything. And there are some people who just, you know, this is the main thing. They want to survive until the next day. So you learn so much about, I think, different cultures. And I think that can make us uh, better people. Uh, when we understand the world a little better. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, that understanding is, I think, an important part of the photographic process mm -hmm. because the key to making successful photos, no matter what your subject is, whether it's a landscape, whether it's a person, whether it's wildlife, the key to making great photos of that subject is understanding that subject, learning its rhythms, its, yeah. its ways. And, you know, obviously understanding a landscape is different than understanding a person or a culture, yeah. but, you know, you have to open yourself to the experience. You have to observe and get a feeling for the rhythms of a place or the rhythms of a culture if you're going to make effective photographs that tell a story. And so I was actually recently on an international photo trip. I went to Ireland for uh, 12 days of photography. Just, just, just photography. You didn't do anything else. I thought I saw some pictures of you doing some other things. <laughs> well, okay. So it was ninety-five percent photography, five percent drinking Guinness. I saw that. I saw that. <laughs> well, it listen, was actually. You know, it, it's funny because you know different places on the island you get different types of Guinness pours, and so the very first Guinness I had, it was a perfect pour, just the perfect amount of foam. And it tasted yeah. delicious. Yeah. And every other Guinness I had after that, the foam ratio was just a little bit off. And oh. so I didn't end up with the same flavor that I had for that first Guinness. So it was a great first Guinness. And then it was kind of a letdown all after that. I didn't know you were such an expert on, on, uh, on beer foam. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, impressed. I'm impressed with this young guy, everyone who's listening. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, knowing something about beer foam, I'm not sure how impressive that is, but uh, <laughs> I appreciate the compliment anyways. It was a, it was a really tough trip because the weather was pretty awful. And I'm, if you don't mind, Rick, I'm just going to share a few. Yeah, I, I saw some of your pictures. Susan and I both loved them. Wow. All right. that. Thank you. Um, so I just thought I'd share a few of my photos. The, the weather was really challenging. Uh, like I think it rained probably about 75% of the time. And when you've got really bad weather and you try to make landscape photos, it can be very, very difficult. And, you know, we're often waiting for that beautiful golden hour, magic hour light. And if you're not getting it, then you've got to switch gears. And so I started off on the Western coast, photographing the ring of Kerry and the Dingle Peninsula. This is a photograph I made. Uh, on the Dingle Peninsula. This is an aerial shot with my drone. And when I first got there, there was actually some good light for about a day or two. Uh, and it was it was really nice light, but I was just arriving. I was just getting into the rhythm of things. I was just beginning to learn what the landscape had to offer. So I, I'm afraid I didn't really capitalize on it very well. So this is one of the better shots I took in the early uh, days where there was actually some good weather. 
And this, you know, I flew my drone off the coast looking back and there was a mountain in the background and there was some nice clouds that were breaking up at sunset. There had been a storm. And so here, basically what I did is I chased the weather. There was a lot of storminess and I was looking for a place where there was less cloud cover in the hopes that I'd get some light breaking through. And I got lucky driving around for a few hours. I finally found a place where there was some clear light. So I would manage to make a photo, um, but it could be very challenging. Can we go back? Get, sorry, go ahead, Rick. Can we go back? Sure. You know, I, I like that picture. Uh, and just a tip here for, for people who are kind of new to photography. One of the reasons why I think this picture really works is, you know, when I tell people about, you know, landscape composition, you want to compose in layers. In other words, you have this foreground layer, you have the middle ground, and then you have the mountain in the back, and then you even have the clouds behind that. So I think one of the reasons why this picture is so cool is because I feel like I'm there because it has such a tremendous sense of depth, even though you're pretty far away. Well, your drone's pretty far away, right? I mean... Uh, yeah, yeah, probably a few hundred feet away from the landform. But uh, it, yes, thank you. Thank you for uh, for the kind is, words. And I think that's a very good way of putting it. I, I do often try to kind of layer my compositions. I think of my compositions like a really tasty cake uh, or a parfait. You know, the more layers there are, the better it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the same with beer foam. <laughs> Same thing with beer foam. Uh, it could be a real challenge, though. I mean, there was a lot of times where you'd get clouds just hanging over the mountains. And so that was one of the, the rhythms of the place that I had to learn. You know, I had to learn the local weather patterns. And there was a lot of moist air coming from the ocean. And when it hit the mountains, it would form clouds. So I knew that if I was on the coast, I'd have a better chance of getting some clear light. But there might be some stormy clouds over the mountains. So in a shot like this, I actually had this really big, dramatic storm cloud on the mountain in the background. And so I just incorporated that into my composition. And, you know, that's I think that's the key thing to photographing in bad weather is you just have to sort of find the subjects that are going to work. You've got to find a way to incorporate that weather. And so if it's really cloudy and overcast and you're, you don't really have anything interesting to photograph, start looking for intimates. So this is a drone shot. I flew over the ocean looking down at some big rocks that were coming out of the water and the light wasn't very strong. So I focused instead on this intimate composition, just something simple. Uh, a lot of times what you want to do when you've got that bad weather coming through is just be out there and wait for those breaks in the weather. Because sometimes you get these very short-lived breaks where a little bit of light comes through. And one moment you're getting rained on, the next moment you've got something that's really interesting. So there were these really great rock formations in this one part of Ireland. And so I did a lot of photography there. And the thing about these rock formations that was really interesting is they had all these swirls on them. And uh, so I used those swirls as compositional shapes. And so this was on a day where there was lots of rain coming through. It was just constantly raining uh, on and off. And so I was just out there waiting for those moments when the weather broke and a little bit of light comes through. And I was able to combine that with that really dramatic stormy sky. So you can see it's raining in the distance. In the upper right, there's a Virga cloud. So that's rain that's coming down and not quite touching the ground. And so I was able to incorporate that bad weather. Uh, and, you know, so this approach requires you to work a little extra harder to wait for those moments. And then every now and then you get lucky and you actually get some light breaking through. So a little bit later on, it cleared up some more when I was photographing these rocks um, and, uh, this was the next morning. So all that rain that had fallen the day before, uh, it was pretty cloudy the next morning, but there was just enough of a gap where the sun was coming up that I was getting that nice golden sunrise light. But all of that moisture from the day before meant there was a lot of fog. Uh, and, uh, that fog I was able to incorporate into the composition. And what I loved about Ireland, it, well, it was one of the cha challenges of Ireland is that there's just settlement everywhere. There's farms everywhere. So anytime I was taking a photo, it seemed like there was some sign of civilization in the background. But those farms just were beautiful. So, you know, they were just covered in green grass and the green grass would glow in the morning or the afternoon light. So having all that glowing green in the background was actually kind of cool. So I learned to embrace the fact that I didn't have any wild views. And so here's a photograph I made in this intricate series of marshes that I found, and I was flying my drone over this. As a matter of fact, this, all these shots, except for the last shot I'm going to show, are drone shots. So the drone was really useful in capturing those fleeting weather uh, events, those breaks in the weather, because if I was on the land, I would have been stuck just in one spot. And if the light was breaking out 
several hundred feet away from me, there's nothing I could do to photograph it. So the drone allowed me flexibility to kind of go to the areas very quickly where there was some light breaking through. And I found these marshes and I took this shot with the drone. Once again, very cloudy day, uh, wasn't very interesting light. The clouds were kind of flat. So looking down and capturing intimate compositions was just a much better strategy. But a lot of times when you have clouds, even though you might not get the light and the color that you want, you might still have a lot of really interesting texture in the clouds. And so I really enjoy photographing even when the light and the color is a little bit more flat when I've got those dramatic stormy clouds. And in situations like this, the dehaze slider in Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw is your best friend. That dehaze slider is designed to add contrast and drama to the sky and it helps bring out the clouds. Here's another shot from those marshes. They were really intricate. And I scouted for these marshes using Google Earth. Basically, I just looked at the satellite view and when I saw something that looked like an interesting landform, I'd zoom in and uh, figure out where it was. And so when I saw these intri intricate patterns from the satellite picture on Google Earth, I was like, you know, that's probably gonna make a, a good photographic subject. It'll be a great place to go droning. And then one of the final destinations I visited is the Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland. And the Giant's Causeway is recognized as one of the great photo wonders of the world. And basically it's a bunch of basalt columns. They're all hexagonal. And these hexagons are maybe about a foot or two across and they're all kind of jammed in uh, one next to another, like a bunch of puzzle pieces or like a game of Tetris. And you just kind of hop from column to column and explore. And I walked out on the causeway. It basically juts out like a peninsula into the ocean. And then looking back at this uh, feature, this hill, this pointy hill in the background. And I made this photograph in the twilight. There was actually uh, a lot of seaweed on these columns because it was at low tide. So I was down below the waterline photographing this. And, you know, the Giant's Causeway is just really an amazing location. It's very famous. But there's a lot of really amazing photo destinations and subjects around the world. And it can be a little hard, it can be a little daunting trying to figure out what those photo wonders of the world are. Uh, and that's where uh, this new venture that Rick and I are launching comes in. Rick, you want to tell everyone about Photo Wonders? Yeah, this is, uh, first of all, I really enjoyed your photographs. And, uh, you know, you didn't have one picture of a castle in there. <laughs> you, know, you know, I was wondering, I, I would, you know, maybe people could say in the chat, I would say I've never seen pictures from Ireland like that. You did an amazing job. And I think uh, your, your tip about looking on Google Earth was really uh, was really good. But those pictures did not look like, you know, I had no, I know people who leave workshops to Ireland and it's, you know, after castle, after castle, after castle. So well, there, there's a lot of castles in Ireland and uh, they were interesting. I was in, I was maybe interested in photographing yeah. them. I was with a friend, my good friend, Erez Marome from Israel. Yeah. And he told me early on, no castles. It's right. not allowed. So uh, I was fine with that. But, you know, what we try to do is find, destinations that are off the beaten path you know so giants causeway was yeah. the one sort of photo icon that i went to but yeah. otherwise i really was trying to find my own compositions and my own places and yeah. so that's something that i often do when i'm out making photos i'm sure you do the same thing rick i do the same thing i do the same thing so anyway getting back to the photo wonders of the world if we could get that slide back up uh, Ian, back up Ian and I have been working on this project for, uh, I guess, about maybe two months. So we were talking about, you know, Ian's been to about 100 countries around the world. I've been about to, I've been to, to about 100 countries around the world. And as we said before, we love traveling. We love the experience of traveling. Uh, and we love sharing, you know, sharing our travel news and sharing uh, our photography news. So we came up with this idea, the photo wonders of the world. And what this site is all about is that we're posting, you know, on the site, <clears throat> a wonder. For example, Antarctica. Uh, I think you have the Falklands up there. I have Tiger's Nest Temple. You know, uh, we have, uh, you know, the or places on the Oregon coast. And what we do is we have like why it's a wonder. 
you know, how to get there, uh, the best time to go. And we have photography tips. But I think the really cool thing about this, it's just not about us. This is really about you, meaning you, the people who are watching the uh, this webinar. You can contribute. You can, you know, comment on, on the wonders. You could add to, you know, what we're saying, but you could post your own wonders. So we really hope this is like going to be like the Wikipedia of the photo of places to go like around the world. And you could discover new places like Ian was showing. I mean, I... I I was really amazed at at, at these new places, and uh, I think you went to a place called the. Was this Singing Sands? Yours, your wonder? Oh uh, yeah, that's in Mongolia. Yeah, the Singing Sands in Mongolia. So you're gonna you're gonna travel virtually. You're gonna travel virtually to places that you know that you've heard of, but also uh, maybe have never heard of. So this is so exciting. I know Ian spent a lot of time on it. I spent a lot of time on it, and it's just so much fun. We have a, a friend. Uh, I have a friend in Japan who posted one recently about uh, Mount Fuji. And, you know, I didn't know there were like cows at the base of Mount Fuji, but she's showing all these fun pictures around Mount Fuji. And I think that's the other thing. This is really a fun site. Yeah, we're going to try to give you the best technical information, like Ian was talking about the dehaze filter. And, you know, we're going to talk about Photoshop and what lenses and bring a tripod and the neutral density filters. But we're also going to try to make it fun because my philosophy is, and I think, Ian, uh, this is maybe one of the reasons why we're uh, good friends, is my philosophy is, uh, is if you're not having fun, you're doing something wrong. Well, that's a great philosophy. And, you know, the idea behind this Photo Wonders project is to make a resource for photographers by photographers. So we're going to be working with our extended network of photo professionals. But we also, as Rick said, we want you, the person who goes to this website for photo inspiration, if you've got really good photos of your own Photo Wonders of the world, please submit them for consideration. So we've got a forum where people can submit their own wonders and the very best wonders will promote to the main site, but your wonders will be there no matter what happens. So it'll be an extended resource for other photographers as well. So we want to build up this database and that's just going to help people when they're doing trip planning. But, you know, the whole goal is to really inspire people to kind of, I don't know, come up with their own photo bucket list and to, you know, get out there, and do their own travel and have their own experiences because it's such an amazing thing. It's something that Rick and I both feel very privileged to do. And so we thought we would preview uh, some of the wonders that we have listed on the site, some of our personal favorite wonders. So without further ado, Rick, why don't you take it away and tell us about this particular wonder of the world? Yeah, this is in, in Antarctica. And, you know, these look like chess pieces to me. We were driving around in the Zodiac. If you look at that piece of blue ice on the right, it maybe looks like a queen, right, looking out. Uh, maybe the a piece of ice on the left looks like, you know, a rook looking out. But, you know, I commented on the first picture, Ian, that you had from uh, – from your recent trip to Ireland about layers. So here we have we have different layers, right? We have the, the dark piece of ice. We have the light piece of ice. We have the piece of ice in the back. So I think this is a good composition uh, idea when we compose, try to compose in layers. Another, you know, I think this is from, uh, well, I know this is from my Antarctica post, but as far as a tip goes, I say expose for the highlights. I'm always exposing for the highlights, meaning the bright, the brightest part of the picture and the, uh, and the, the you know, the bright, the bright snow and ice here. Because if there's if the if the brightest part of the picture is overexposed more than a stop, it's going to be pretty hard to get it back in Photoshop and Lightroom. So we're going to be giving tips like this and to try, as as Ian said, try to inspire people. We're going to have fun pictures like this. You know, these penguins. We were out in the Zodiac one morning. And by the way, if you go to Antarctica. My guess is that you'll like the Zodiac tours the best because you go out, you know, you can get some nice pictures from the ship and nice pictures on the land. But when you're, when you're on the Zodiac and you're cruising around all of the pieces of blue ice and you come up to some penguins like this having like an early morning conversation, or maybe the guy in the foreground is a little bored with the conversation. But, you know, I, I know I'm putting human feelings you know, onto, onto these uh, animals. But, uh, you know, to see a scene like this, you know, at the bottom of the world where it's so quiet and you're, you're so, it takes like uh, three days to get there. You are really far removed from everything that's going on in the world. It's uh, just uh, Antarctica is definitely, you know, one of my favorite uh, photo wonders of the world. Yeah, you know, scientists say that it takes people on average about three days to adjust to new situations. Yeah. So like, for example, you know, when you take away someone's cell phone, it takes them maybe three days to kind of get into the habit of of not compulsively checking right. for texts and things mm -hmm. like that. And they kind of get used to the new paradigm. And so it yeah. sounds like basically the three day 
uh, yeah. travel time to get to Antarctica is just enough time to get you into that new mindset, which is perfect for yeah. doing travel photography. It allows you to really get in the moment and yeah. be present when you're out there making photos. Yeah, here's an uh, for sure. Although they do, they have a great internet on the ship. <laughs> the ship <laughs> no, they have unbelievable internet. It's uh, actually we live in Cronon Hudson where we have bad service. I'm on like WhatsApp talking to Susan and to Susan and my son Marco every day. Anyway, uh, Rick, another another picture from the Hello, Rick. Uh, another picture from uh, Antarctica. And and the tip here is, you know, when I take a landscape picture, and I noticed this in your pictures, and correct me if I'm wrong, but in, in please correct me, uh, everything in the scene is in focus. And in your landscape pictures, you know, everything was in focus. It seemed that way. So when I'm in, in the Zodiac and taking a picture like this, you know, I'm, I'm using a wide angle lens, a small aperture, and I'm focusing one third into the scene. I know there's apps that help you, you know, do that. But when you're riding riding around in the Zodiac, you don't, you don't want to bring out your phone and check an app. But, you know, this picture, again, has that sense of depth where you have the foreground element, you have the middle element, then you have the background element. And you mentioned the sky before in your picture. I used a little bit of the dehaze to create, you know, when you go to Antarctica, by the way, the sky is usually like this in the summertime. Yeah, it seems like the weather there is very similar to Ireland. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. But I mean, you know, the, 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 what, what's the most important thing in a picture? And it's the mood, it's the feeling and it, I, the sky in your picture. And in this picture, I think, you know, if it was a bright, sunny day, it wouldn't have that, that feeling of drama, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, you've got that dramatic sky and you've got a lot of native color in the ice. So mm -hmm. the softer light works very well here. And I just love how this composition is put together, the foreground leading to the middle ground, to the background, to the sky. It really draws the viewer in. And I think that's why that layering approach to composition works so well. It creates a path for the viewer, a bunch of stepping stones, if you will, that help pull them into the scene and make them feel like they're a part of it. Yeah. Oh, so man. Uh, going from uh, ice to fire, <laughs> uh, one of my personal favorite photo wonders of the world is uh, Naira Gongo volcano in the Congo, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. This is an active volcano and it has a persistent lava lake at the top of the mountain. And it's very difficult to get there. Uh, Congo as a travel destination it can be, you know, uh, hit or miss, I suppose, is the best way to put it. Sometimes I would say it's not really safe enough to go. There are moments where things stabilize and they start bringing tourists in again. Uh, so I went there a few years ago. And so getting to the Congo was was a little bit tricky. And then once you arrive at the volcano, you've got like a five or six thousand foot vertical ascent to get up to the top of the volcano. It's about 10,000 feet above sea level. And you spend the night up there. They've got these huts at the crater rim. And it is easily one of the most amazing experiences I've ever had in my life. Going up there, you're on the crater rim. If you're there in the daylight, you can't really see the lava lake that well. But when it starts to get dark and you move into the twilight, suddenly you just see this massive churning lava lake 700 feet below you and you're just standing on the, cr the crater rim looking down. You feel like you're on the edge of a cliff looking straight down into this bubbling pool of lava. And it's mesmerizing. It's active. It's persistent. This is a wider angle view. So that's the crater rim that I was standing on that I used as the foreground for this wide angle shot. And you can see the lava lake down below. It is just one of the most amazing things I have ever seen in my life. So, you know, when things stabilize in the Congo, yeah. you should definitely consider checking it out. It's an amazing experience and uh, something that I would recommend to everyone. Was it hot there? Um, well, no, actually, it's quite cold. So you couldn't really feel the heat of the volcano coming yeah. up because you were far enough away. And so you're 10,000 feet above sea level. So it was actually uh -huh. kind of chilly. It wasn't below freezing at night, but it definitely got fairly cold. Um, it was just just an amazing experience. It was really incredible. So it's challenging to get there. And I know not everyone's going to be able to make it. Uh, but uh, definitely something that I highly recommend if you've got the legs for it. Wow, that that is impressive. Uh, this picture was taken in Bosque del Apache, where we are doing uh, 
two workshops, right? In December, right. Bosque del Apache, New Mexico. And we're doing it in December because this is, we were talking about timing before. This is the time to go there. Uh, you come with us, you'll see thousands of birds, thousands of birds, you know, and hundreds in the scene at one time. And this was taken, uh, you know, late in the afternoon. And a couple of tips here. You, when we're photographing multiple birds, we want to have what's called, uh, we want to seek separation. This is one of my salmonisms. I have a lot of Kelpie one classes and salmonisms is one of them. So we have, you know, a separation between the birds here. We also, also when it comes to bird photography, it's usually wings up or wings down, right, Ian? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, on the left, the wings are up in the, in the middle, it's uh, wings down and on the right, they're straight out. But also, you know, when we compose it, this for, for whatever reason, maybe Ian knows, we like, we like uh, you know, there's something called the rule of odds, right? We like an <laughs> odd number of subjects. So anyway, we have the foreground element, we have the background element. But, you know, as, as we, we talked about, the most important thing in a photograph, it's the mood and it's the feeling. So you photograph, you know, you know right at sunset, uh, when you have this beautiful mood and, you know, silhouettes are nice because silhouettes have a sense of mystery. Uh, there's a, there's an expression that says, uh, when you take the, when you destroy, this doesn't apply to all photographs, but the, it goes something like when you destroy the mystery of the photograph, you destroy the photograph. Again, it doesn't apply to all <laughs> photographs, but, but it's true, right? This picture has like a sense of mystery. So, um, anyway, hope you can come with us. It's going to be fun. We're also going to White Sands. I've been to Bosque five times, haven't been to uh, White Sands. Um, so, you know, <clears throat> on a photo wonder site, you could go to the site, you could check out a Bosque del Apache. What I try to do, and I know Ian does this, you just saw here the tight shot of the volcano uh, and then the wide shot. In, in the previous shot, we had a tighter shot, and here's the wider shot. So I always have two lenses, and this is what I recommend. This is what I recommend in my Bosque post here. You know, you take the telephoto lens. I was using the Canon 100 to 500 millimeter, the RF 100 to 500 millimeter for the previous shot, and here's a 24 to 105. So you know, trying to tell the story is uh, is really important when you go to a location. So here again, we have this nice uh, foreground element, and this is what I'm talking. When you see all these birds in the sky, it's called a in the morning, it's called a blast off. In the, <laughs> the evening, yeah. it's, called, it's called a blast in because these birds are actually coming in in for a landing. But you know what? What this doesn't capture, uh, Ian's been there, it, the sound, right? Yeah. I mean, they call it blast off for a reason. It sounds like gunfire. You've suddenly yeah. got like a thousand wings at once just yeah. going out and the birds just take off. And it's just an amazing experience. And once they're flying, they're honking. It's a cacoph uh, cacophony of sound. It's 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 really just it's you have to experience it. You know, and that's the I think the challenge of photography is that when you're out there experiencing these amazing things, yeah. you, you can't bring it all back to the viewer. You have to make a decision about what you can bring back. You're robbed immediately of sound and yeah. smell. You're robbed of the third dimension of depth. And so yeah. you have to figure out a way in your photograph to trick the viewer into right. experiencing these other senses that the photograph can't convey. And so that's why composition and the creative use of light and choosing the magic of the moment are so important because you need to tell that story yeah. so that the viewer can have that vicarious experience. They can feel like they're part of the story. And that's, that is the ultimate challenge of photography. Oh, absolutely. And speaking of the challenge, you know, when it comes to wildlife, you know, gesture is so important. And I pick my wildlife pictures based on gesture. So I have a lot of pictures of sandhill cranes, but none have the gesture captured in this picture. You know, I, I love the gesture of the tip of the wings just up and the feet and a little bit of splash behind and the eye. So I pick my picture, most of my pictures based on a gesture. Just another tip uh, if the, in, uh, in wildlife photography, unless you're going for a silhouette, if if the eye's not in focus, you and I have missed the shot. So, you know, here I'm using the Canon uh, R3 and I'm using that focus tracking and the animal tracking and the eye detection. But, you know, it's really all about the light and the mood and the feeling. So, uh, yeah, I I, you know, what I love about this shot, Rick, is uh, the bird looks like a dancer, like a ballet dancer. Right. Yeah.
No, the the birds are amazing. So again, if we just went back to we don't have to, but if we went back to the 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 shots here, we have you know that was a tight shot. Here, here's like a medium shot. Then we have the wide shot. So what we want to do is when we're putting together a gallery or posting pictures on the on the web, it's nice to have you know those pictures like you say that that tell the story that uh, you know the. I like what the way you put it that the pictures rob us of the things like the sound and and the smell and things like that. That's good. I might use that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, maybe you, come up, you know, I have the salmonisms. You could come up with plantisms, you know, like I, a couple of sayings. Well, you know, so salmonism sounds better than plantisms. Yeah, I, I felt like speaking of being robbed, I was robbed by the name that I was given at birth. I, I don't have a cool name. You know, like the best name for a photographer. I think the, the luckiest person alive as a photographer is Art Wolf. Oh, what absolutely. a great name. <laughs> Art Wolf, I know. Yeah, I mean, it just doesn't get any better than that. Rick Salmon's not that bad either, but, you know, Ian Plant, I don't know. It just sounds weak and pathetic. Salmon wasn't good in, in a Catholic grammar school, I'll tell you that. <laughs> you know, hey, Salmon, you're going to swim upstream, you know, all that. But speaking yeah. of the plant, speaking of plant and uh, and Salmon, uh, we, we talked, actually, we talked about changing the name of our workshops to just uh, a surf and turf workshops, right? That's right. Surf, so salmon, the salmon turf. represents the ocean, the surf, and plants represent the land, the turf. So we're surf and turf. We're surf and turf. It's much better than salmon and plant. Yeah. <laughs> hey, if anyone has any comments, uh, where uh, don't be shy, as Ian said there in, in his note there. Yeah, please. If you have any questions, uh, we also have the results of our poll. It looks like North America is the hands down winner with Europe coming in second. That's a surprise. I thought Africa would have a stronger showing. Uh, and speaking of Africa, one of my personal favorite photo wonders of the world are mountain gorillas. Wow. And you can only find mountain gorillas in three places in the world, the Congo, Uganda and Rwanda. And all three have got developed gorilla tourism. There's only about a thousand mountain gorillas left alive in the wild. They're a critically endangered species. Being with them, trekking with them, you're actually out there with the gorillas, with wild gorillas. And you're not supposed to get within like about 21 feet of the gorillas, but the gorillas don't get the memo. They often come closer to you. And when you're working with the guides, they'll tell you that if a gorilla comes your way, that if you can't get out of the way, just stay still and look down and try not to be aggressive or threatening. And having a gorilla walk right past you. So one of the most amazing experiences I had when I was trekking with gorillas in Rwanda was having a silverback gorilla walk right by me. So, you know, you're in this thick jungle. You can't really move around that easily. So I was standing next to my guide and the gorilla decided to walk by us. So the guide is like, okay, don't move. Just stay right here. Look down. And so we both looked down and the gorilla, this massive silverback, you know, like the, the 600 pound gorilla, as they say, as a matter of fact, it might have been even bigger. I don't know how big it was. Uh, it stops right in front of me. And it takes a look at me and then it looks at my guide and then it proceeds to knock the guide over, just, you know, reaches out and pushes him over. And the guides warn you that this might happen, that the gorillas, they're not violent, they're not aggressive, but they like to show their dominance and they might throw a stick at you or they might charge you to kind of show you who's boss or they might even give you a friendly little shove. So the guide was fine. He was knocked over. He got up laughing. The gorilla moved on. And I was so disappointed that the gorilla chose to knock over the guide and not me. I wanted to have that in my resume, pushed over by a silverback mountain gorilla. Uh, so even though I was a little disappointed by not being pushed over by the gorilla, still trekking with gorillas is one of the most amazing wildlife experiences I've ever had. And I've actually been fortunate enough to trek with gorillas in all three countries, Rwanda, Uganda, and Congo. If you're going to visit the volcano in the Congo, you can combine that with a gorilla trek because they're in the same area. And it is not only an amazing experience, but it's also just a lot of fun doing photography with the gorillas. They're, they're just beautiful animals. And when you're with them, you realize that they're really close cousins to humans. You can see a lot of us in them. It's just amazing how similar they are to people uh, and also how different they are. Uh, and they really are just incredibly beautiful, gentle animals, with the exception of the occasional pushing over of a person. <laughs> it's a really fantastic experience. But speaking of wildlife experiences, another 
one of the amazing wildlife experiences in the world, leads us to Rick's photograph here. Rick, why don't you tell us about this location? Yeah, have you been to Galapagos? I have, I've been there once. Well, we've been there a few times, and uh, when my son was born, Susan and I said, if we could take Marco only, and his name Marco, named after Marco Polo, because we travel a lot with him. Uh, <laughs> we could, we could take, really, seriously. And his middle name is Christopher after Christopher Columbus, so Marco Christopher. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> anyway, we said if we could only take him one place, it would be uh, Galapagos. So anyway, they have all these amazing animals, and we were talking about in Africa where you can get really close to the animals. The animals aren't hunted in Galapagos, so you can get really close. So here I'm using, uh, a, at this time, a 17 to, uh, I think a 17 to 35 millimeter lens. This is taken at the 17 millimeters. So another one of my salmonisms, by the way, is use your camera like a spaceship. In other words, move it up and move it down for creative composition. So I'm getting down low because I really wanted to show the power, you know, of these uh, of these beasts that look like they're they look like they're out of like a dinosaur movie. But you know, I, this picture. It's kind of like the picture I took in Bosque of the three birds. It illustrates that separation. So I'm moving back and forth, using my camera like a spaceship again, by the way, <laughs> moving back and forth because I'm seeking that separation. So, you know, and I want to get the eye in focus and I'm photographing in layers. I'm using a small aperture to get the, the scene in focus. So I'm big on what's called photo cross training. What you learn in one area, you could apply to another area. So the same tips uh, and the ideas that I was using in Bosque for those three birds are the same tips uh, that I was using here. But it, it is amazing. And these guys, by the way, if you go to Galapagos, these guys spit. And they spit salt water. <laughs> they spit it out. Actually, they don't spit it. They, they project it out of their nostrils. So you don't want to get uh, too close to them. And if you get close, bring, definitely bring like a lens cleaning cloth. <laughs> also for... Or and where I live. face cleaning cloth. <laughs> well, you definitely need a face cleaning cloth too. But it's just so magical uh, being able to get to, you know, this place. You know, you have to fly from Ecuador, you know, over there. Mm -hmm. And what I would recommend, and we talk about this, you know, on our Photo Wonders of the World site, you know, you want to go by boat and you want to go to different islands because there's different there's different life on each island. But what a magical experience to be, you know, again, removed from, you know, the hustle and bustle of daily life. And uh, I think this, it's really important to be close to nature. And I know you agree. And that's probably why, well, I'm, you know, you're out there a lot, right, Ian? Yeah, uh, well, and I think that point kind of leads to what I wanted to say that I really like about this photo, because I think, What's great about this photo is it shows you the power of a wide angle lens. And so a wide angle lens makes everything look small and more remote. And the mm -hmm. trick to doing effective wild, wide angle photography is to get close to your subjects, because when you get close, you make them bigger. Mm -hmm. And so wide angle photography might seem like it's removed from the subject because it's making everything look remote and smaller. But when you're getting close to make it bigger in the frame, then it's a much more intimate experience than if you're shooting with like a telephoto lens. So wide angle photography is really an intimate experience when you're photographing wildlife. And it, you know, as you were saying, you just kind of immerse yourself in nature. You become a part of it when you're doing this wide angle photography. That's why I love wide angle photography, whether it's wildlife or landscape or anything else. I feel like I need to get into the scene. I need to immerse myself into my subject, what I'm doing. Uh, it's a very intimate experience. You got to kind of immerse yourself in the nitty gritty of what's going on. You really have to look at the details and uh, you become very, very aware of what's going around uh, around you. So what's amazing to me is that these marine iguanas are actually quite small, but because of yeah, that yeah. wide angle perspective, because you're so close, they look like Godzilla. Yeah. Uh, by the way, for those uh, listeners and watchers, viewers who don't know, Ian is the king of wild, wide angle photography. You have a Kelby <laughs> one class, right? What's it? It's a what's it called? Wide angle landscape photography or something like that? Yeah, it was during the last Kelby live uh, yeah, conference. Yeah. Yep. You are the king. You are the king of uh, of wildlife. Actually, I think I you know I like to shoot tight <laughs> as as. A, <laughs> illustrated by the pictures we've seen so far, but you are the king, so I've learned a lot from you. Anyway, uh, before I get to this picture, uh, and I want to ask you, Ian, I know you know about uh, wildlife. I, I This is a blue-footed booby, and I don't know why it's called a blue-footed booby. Any idea? Uh, <laughs> could it be the blue feet? 
so. I think so. Hey, just backing up to one of the questions, our friend Lori Rubin uh, from the, uh, DxO Software that does a Nick collection. She says surf and turf. She likes. She thinks that surf and turf is a cute idea. So, uh, <laughs> we, have to, we have to revisit that. Anyway. Uh, this is a blue-footed booby, and I, I just, you know, sometimes I compose for color, and here I was composing for color, and I'm getting that eye in focus, and I'm trying to, now I'm always thinking about the background. Ian, could we quickly go back to your first picture of the mountain gorilla, which has something in common with this? Um, um, well, let me see. It yeah, will yeah. be not quickly, but yes, we're back to it. Okay. What I really like about that is the really shallow depth of field. And I wanted to mention this, that you have the eyes mm -hmm. totally in sharp focus, but even the back of the gorilla's head, you know, the, the hair back there uh, is, is out of focus and the background is totally out of focus. So I think, you know, that by doing that, by using that, that, um, a type of those type of settings like here i didn't want the background on focus here the background was like ugly brown rocks right and dark black mm -hmm. rocks so i'm using a wide aperture or long lens uh to to separate that subject from the background and to hide <laughs> and to hide how ugly that uh, background is but just what a beautiful animal so i like to take the action shots as, as you've seen but i also like to take uh like to take animal uh, portraits and, and just yeah, and, you know, I think your your point about how you can use your camera equipment and your settings to be selective about what you include and yeah. what you exclude from the shot. That's the great thing about photography yeah. is as the photographer, as an artist, you get to choose what's in the composition. You get to choose what's in focus and what's out of focus. You can make yeah. these creative choices and you can present a selective view of your subject. And so earlier I was talking about how, you know, photography uh, doesn't give everyone the full experience. And I was kind of lamenting that, that you can't give people the full experience. And then you've got to figure out a way to tell the story of that experience in your photograph. Uh, but on the flip side, one of the great things about photography is that you can be very selective in what you share with your audience. You can be selective about the story you're telling and you can use these choices that you make, these creative and technical choices to be selective. And sometimes being more selective, uh, sort of narrowing the focus of the viewer helps you better tell the story of the subject. Because, you know, as Rick was saying, there was a lot of visual chaos in the background. And that visual chaos wasn't contributing to this scene or subject. And so he made a technical choice using a shallow depth of field, using a very, very large aperture on a telephoto lens to throw that background out of focus so he could focus the viewer on the most important part of the story. Uh, that's for sure. The other thing I did on that picture, and I don't know if it happened naturally on your picture, but, you know, Ansel Adams said, you know, a picture's not done until you darken the edges. So, uh, <laughs> but, you know, so I darken the edges here, but I do that a lot. I use the, I yeah. use the, the vignette filter, you know, I use the dark and light and center uh, filter in Nick, or you could do it a, a, a radial filter, uh, in, in Photoshop and camera and in camera raw and, uh, and in, in Lightroom, but I, I do that a lot. I darken the edges to draw that uh, the, the attention right to the subject. And sometimes uh, I'll even darken part of the subject because here, what's the main thing? It's the, it's the blue-footed booby's eye. You know, looking mm -hmm. at this picture, it looks like this guy has like something big in his throat, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. But but what a what a you know what a magnificent animal. But the next picture, this is an amazing. Speaking of the photo wonders of the world, you know the the the, the great migration of the wildebeest and the zebra. This and the zebras in in Kenya. This is a Masa. They're crossing the Mara River here. This is just an amazing experience. And you mentioned the sound before. I wish you guys could like hear the sound of here because, and what, what happens is sometimes you have to wait for hours. Sometimes you have to wait for days for this to happen. Uh, Susan and I have been there uh, twice to see this. And, so, and one time we had to wait actually a few hours. So the zebra and the wildebeest wait on one side of the river and we think it's safe to go. They, they, you know, one goes and then they all start to go. But I noticed this in in in, uh, in one of Ian's aerial pictures. Um, actually, in two of the aerial pictures, it, there was like some motion to the picture because the line in your. Um, I know we can't mm -hmm. go back. There was there were some of the lines of those uh, the in in the, in the marshes or whatever they were. They were going at an angle. Or the rocks in the very first picture. That's it. The rocks in the very first picture also. Yeah. We're going at an angle. So here I'm composing. I'm asking the driver to, you know, I, I saw them going. I just I don't want to shoot them just straight on. I want to create kind of like an S curve here. 
and I'm looking for separation. And here, this is taken with a 100 to 400 millimeter lens, but yeah, so I'm zooming in, but I'm using here a small aperture because I wanted to get as much of the scene um, in focus. So th this is really, really, truly one of the wonders of the world. And most, most of these guys make it across the river, but there are a lot of you know, crocodiles there. And I do have pictures. We're not going to show them because maybe some people having lunch on the rewatch are going to have dinner. <laughs> when a crocodile gets a zebra or a wildebeest, it's not a pretty sight. But basically what happens, and we talk about, I think I talk about this in my write-up of the wonders, there's something called migration watch. And you could actually watch where the animals are going because the zebras and the wildebeest, they follow the rain around. Uh, so they always have something to eat. And then, then the predators are between Kenya and Tanzania. And then the the uh, pr the predators follow these guys around, so they always have something to eat. But Ian, don't you think just w watching a, and experience the circle of life is just, you know, just, you know, you almost can't describe it. Yeah, and I mean, it it is the the Mara Triangle. You know, Tanzania, Serengeti, the Masamara in Kenya. It, it really is one of the most amazing photo wonders of the world, and. You know, it, it's interesting the way you talked about the circle of life. What I love about these photos that you took here is the circle shape or the curving shapes that are created yeah. by your compositional choices. And so one of the experiences that you lose when you take a photograph is motion, is energy. You lose mm -hmm. that dynamic feel of the world because you're creating something that's completely static. And so the way you bring energy into your two-dimensional static photograph is through composition. So choosing dynamic compositional shapes, shapes that get the viewer's eye engaged in moving around, that recreates that feeling of motion. And so the shapes mm -hmm. that you chose for these compositions, these, you know, like the S-curve in this photograph, yeah. you can see the path of the wildebeest going down and curving around yeah. and then coming up on the other side. That S-curve is a very dynamic shape. And it really injects a lot of energy into this composition. It helps tell the story. It helps bring the photograph to life for the viewer. So, you know, I could talk about composition for weeks, months, years <laughs> on end. Uh, and if you want to learn more, definitely check out my ultimate uh, photo, uh, my ultimate photography composition course. Uh, you can find that in the um, over at Photo Masters. Uh, it's uh, behind the pro paywall. Uh, and you could definitely learn a lot more there. Um, but, you know, looking for these dynamic shapes, uh, you know, S curves, diagonal lines, you know, Rick mentioned that earlier, those are very dynamic shapes. Those are really great ways of getting the viewer engaged and getting them interested in what's going on in your composition. And so, you know, the Mara and the Serengeti plains of Tanzania are well known for the wildebeest migration and the migration really is an amazing event. And, you know, definitely if you're visiting that area, you want to see the migration, you're going to see the migration. It's going on constantly. But the migration is just part of the story. Mm -hmm. And it arguably is, <laughs> in many ways, uh, the least important part of the story. Because the, the other part of the equation, and I'm just going to share a few of my photos from this area as well, is the predators that are drawn there because of mm -hmm. all the wildebeest and all the zebras. So you get the big three. You get lions. You get uh, leopards and you get cheetahs, and they are there to engage in that circle of life that Rick was talking about. And there are so many of these big predators, and they're actually pretty easy to find. Uh, in any given day, you're going to see a number of these, and the photographic opportunities are incredible. So I definitely recommend that people consider planning a photo trip to uh, the Serengeti Plains of Tanzania or the Mara of Kenya. As a matter of fact, Rick and I, are leading a photo tour in Tanzania in the Serengeti next October. Uh, so October, 2023, we still got a few openings. So you definitely want to check that out. You can find more information on Rick's website or my website, ianplant.com. And that is the end of our presentation for today. We've got a few minutes to answer any questions that come up, but I just wanted to very quickly thank our sponsors for Photo Wonders. So uh, we're working with a few companies, Platypod, they make these ground level setups, you know, so that, you know, when you can't get your tripod down to ground level, you can use their Platypod to get down to that low angle setting. Uh, Adorama, which is a really great uh, retail vendor of camera equipment. Uh, Delkin Devices, they uh, create um, 
storage devices. So definitely, if you want to make sure that you're capturing all those images and they're going to be secure, you're going to want to have really good uh, 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 media cards that you have in your camera. And then Breakthrough Filters, uh, who, of course, are making uh, photographic filters. Rick, you want to say anything else about the sponsors? Well, the Breakthrough Filters are amazing. These are the most, you know, color accurate filters. A lot of people get neutral density filters. They put it on and the colors are way off, right? Mm -hmm. So this is one of their claims to fame, you know, plus, you know, they're so sharp. Delkin devices, I don't know, but I'm using the R3. Uh, I, I, I'm using the CFast cards. I don't know if I could ever go back to like, even though the R3 takes an SD card, the CFast cards, those of you who are watching who haven't used a, C, a CFast card, they're so fast. Adorama is amazing. They have great prices, uh, great service. And Platypod is just, uh, you know, this flat little device. You put your ball head on there and you can take it anywhere. Uh, I never leave home without it. So yeah, we really do want to thank our uh, our founding sponsors uh, because uh, we're really going to build this up to be an amazing site. And uh it's just going to, I, I wake up every morning, actually, it's one of the first things I do. I'm having my coffee. I go on the site. I see what Ian's posting. I see what some other people are posting. We have invited some friends for their launch. A friend, Grace from Japan and uh, Alex Morley, an amazing photographer, Greg Vaughn, who's going to be in the Badlands when you're doing your workshop there. So we've invited some other people. So we really encourage you, you know, to comment on the one, because you could go there now. I think we have 54 up there. We have 54 between Ian and myself and some other friends, we have 54 wonders, but we would love to see your wonders because uh, we, we I, I think it's really important for as photographers to stay inspired, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's real. Think it's real. Oh, my, oh, Diane Gordon's here. Diane Gordon, uh, she was with me in a Casper Stan. Thank you, Ian and Rick. Okay, Andy, thanks. And, Rick, what's your email? Uh, <laughs> it's ricksalmon.com. <laughs> Uh, Robin, happy Earth Day, everybody. David, David, uh, David thought didn't get my joke about why is the blue footed booby called a blue footed booby, but that's okay. You know, <laughs> that in the next webinar, I, I, I have the, I have the other, uh, I have uh, boobies with other feet. But uh, anyway, we can't go through all the comments, but we really want to thank uh, everybody and thanks uh, Ian for putting this together. And just as a, a quick note, this is how Ian and I became friends. Can I tell the story, Ian? Go for it. <laughs> well, I, I met Ian, this young guy out in out of, out of Oregon. He uh, is this uh, photography conference out there. I was impressed with his work, impressed with his uh, teaching style. And that was it. You know, I just met him. So I break my ankle last July. And uh, a lot of people sent me nice things. But uh, Ian sent me this giant gift basket with all these goodies in it. And I think there were six bottles of wine in there. I think Something there were like six that. bottles wine and i said that this guy he doesn't he didn't really know me and he sent this to me and i said uh this guy really cares and uh i've had this discussion with a lot of people like why do you become friends with people and why do you like people and uh one of the things that i like is that people care but also i, I become friends with people i respect and I, I respect Ian for, you know, all the work he does, you know, and his photography, his dedication to, to teaching and stuff like that. But anyway, that's how we became friends. Uh, it was the gift basket. <laughs> and, and we've been friends ever since. Well, it, it's funny because you sent me a picture of your rescue uh, after oh, yeah. you broke your ankle. I think you, you sent me a picture from the hospital. I just felt so bad for you. I was like, well, he's going to be you know, basically laid up for about a month. And I was yeah. trying to imagine if I was stuck at home lying in bed for a month, what would I want? And immediately yeah. I thought, oh yeah, lots of wine. So yeah. uh, that's why I sent that gift basket. But now I get into trouble when I talk with my friends and I tell them about this story. They're all yeah, like, well, you've basket. never sent me a gift basket. And I'm <laughs> like, well, you've never broken your ankle for a month. So I had to send yeah. out a bunch of gift baskets to some of my closest <laughs> friends in the past few weeks. Uh, to uh, make up for the fact that they'd never gotten anything. So <laughs> that, that's funny. That's that's funny. Yeah. Okay. Well, I won't tell that story. And I'll, I'll just make it, you know, uh, one bottle of wine and lots of cheese. I'll cut out the wine. <laughs> so but anyway, well, uh, this is being recorded. So for those of you who joined us, thanks. But also tell your friends. We're going to have a link. Uh, we'll put it on social media and we'll put it everywhere so you could. Um, you could uh, share with your friends. 
Yeah, absolutely. And that's all we have time for today. But thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you for your amazing comments. Check out photowonders.com and we'll see you again soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Rick, for coming on. Bye bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone.